Now, on the eve of the anniversary of his first year in office, the president faces the possibility of a domestic crisis, a midnight deadline to keep the federal government open. And with fears of a shutdown growing, both parties are pointing fingers at the other. That brings us to the analysis of Shields and Brooks. That's syndicated columnist Mark Shields and New York Times columnist David Brooks. Welcome, gentlemen, on this uh, uh, deadline night. So, David, where is your finger pointing? <laughs> uh, I really don't know. I'm embarrassed for my country. You know, we, we got used to these shutdowns, but we really shouldn't. Every, it's all so stupid. If we had, like, a, a Dwight Eisenhower or Franklin Roosevelt, they'd just say, okay, let's get in the room, we'll figure, we'll figure it out, and they'd act like grown -ups. They would feel so demeaned to go through the rituals of condemnation. And so we shouldn't forget that elemental fact. It shouldn't be like this. The second thing, though, and I, the way I think this is actually a significant moment, is that it does represent the parties defining themselves in the base, in, in the middle of a big demographic shift in the country. Uh, this is all funneling down to a debate about immigration. We used to have debates about the size of government or debates about war and peace. But immigration is now one of the central issues in American life, and it's really at the core of this, of this thing. And the, the Republicans clearly feel, especially in red states, they can go to red states and say, you know, we want to keep government open for Americans, we want to keep health care for Americans, we want to keep the army for Americans, and they want to hold it up for a bunch of illegal Americans. So which party do you support? And that's, that's what Republicans are going to hang their hat on in a country that's rapidly diversifying. How do you uh, size all this? Well, I, I, the only place I disagree with David uh, is the Republicans don't say illegal Americans. Uh, right. They say they say illegals. Uh, uh, and, and like everybody else, uh, like David and I, and I'm sure you, we made a decision at the age of six or eight where we were going to live, uh, where we were going to go to school, uh, and uh, what country we were going to, uh, whose flag we were going to uh, honor. Um, and uh, overwhelmingly, this is an issue uh, where which Republicans are on the short side. Americans of both parties, independents, <clears throat> believe that people who've come, been brought here uh, had no decision in illegal entry, who've gone up here, worked, and, and contributed to the country, are entitled to legal status. And the, the, the problem is, quite, quite frankly, the Democrats have chosen this as the one issue to make a fight on. Um, and uh, which does echo uh, not simply the cause itself, but the politics of 2016 and identity politics. Um, and uh, of all the targets of opportunity that Donald Trump and these Republicans have given them, from knocking people off of health care uh, to, uh, to attacking widows and orphans, they, they, they've chosen this one. It is one, quite frankly, this issue, uh, that the Democrats prevail on overwhelmingly across the country. What Mitch McConnell and the Republicans in the Senate are playing right now is state-by-state -state politics. It puts Democrats in red states, they think, on the defensive, whether it's Joe Manchin in West Virginia, <laughs> Joe Donnelly in Indiana, I can't. But it, so it sounds like David Mark is saying the Democrats are making the wrong call by, by hanging this argument, hanging their argument on, on uh, whether to keep the government open on, on immigration. Yeah, well, I would say it depends on your time frame. Uh, in the short term, it probably redounds to both parties' Ill, Ill will. Nobody's going to be persuaded here. The polls say who's to blame. Democrats say the Republicans are. The Republicans say the Democrats are. This is not an, the sort of issue on which people are persuaded by evidence. Uh, they just go back to their partisan camp. In the medium term, 2018, if it matters in 2018, and I think the party's basic posture on immigration will matter, I agree with Mark. It's bad. If you're a red state senator trying to hold on to your seat, this is a bad posture for you. It's just, it's just not good. In the longer term, of course, mm -hmm. if the Republicans maintain the party not only of Donald Trump, but they turn into the party of Tom Cotton, mm -hmm. who wants to cut legal immigration by 50%, right. then that, to me, is, is ruinous for the party. And one of the things that's fascinating, I think one of the reasons there's so much confusion here, is this was a party that had a very strong Lindsey Graham, John McCain, George W. Mm -hmm. Bush wing. And suddenly, that shifted. And how far has it shifted? Has it shifted all the way over to Tom Cotton? A lot further than a lot of us thought. And so people are trying to catch up to where the party has shifted. And Donald Trump has muddied the waters by being here, being there, being there, but mostly pretty restrictionist. But Mark, you're saying the Democrats had a choice. They didn't have to make this about DACA, about immigration, but they chose to do that. And they're taking a risk, you're saying. Well, yeah, I mean, let me, let me be very clear. I think the Democrats are on the right side of history. I think they're on the right side morally. 
I'm, I'm talking about the political judgment and the, and the political assessment uh, that is made. And uh, will it work for Democrats in House races across the country? Generically, yes. It will give, put the Democrats in the advantage, the Republicans at the disadvantage. But when you're Mitch McConnell and you're trying to hold on to the Senate, you're, you're trying to figure out how I can put Heidi Heitkamp in North Dakota on the, uh, on the defensive. The Republicans can't find anybody to run against her. Everybody's passed on it. Uh, and uh, how do they take on Claire McGaskill uh, in Missouri, or Joe Donnelly in Indiana, bo both of whom have proved themselves to be formidable in, a, in red states and in winning elections? So, you know, I, I think that's, that's, that's really where it is. I just, I just think that there, there are more opportunities for the Democrats who in 2016 were, and I think rightly, rightly targeted as a, a party of identity politics, of reaching out to constituency by constituency. Well, if that, I would say yeah, the one ahead. thing that, you know, the tide has been swinging, it looks like, in the Democratic direction in 2018. And the only way they can mess it up that I can imagine so far is uh, if they have a base election. If they go, if they make their voters in New York and San Francisco and L.A. super happy, but make the voters in in Indiana and Tennessee and Missouri super unhappy. And that they risk that. Uh, that sort of fissure with this. So that's the that's the state by state or district by district political calculus. But David, is there a price to pay from a from a standing back and looking at this from the way Washington runs standpoint, from the fact that it just looks again like it's a place where they can't get the the job done? Well, I think the big story there is a lot of people around the country look at Washington and say, why would I ever want to go there? Why would I ever want to pay attention to that stuff? Why would I ever believe in that system? And that's a, that's a problem for the country as a whole. It's just government is obsolescence. If we're going to fix problems, we've got to do it some other way because that thing ain't working. It's a more specific, and Marcus made this point in the past, it's a more specific problem for Democrats because yeah. the party of government uh, has to live with the discrediting of government. And it's in the long term, as people have become more disgusted and distrustful of the government, it served the Republican Party, at least politically, reasonably well. And this coincides, Mark, as we've been saying, with the one-year anniversary of President Trump's uh, year in office, time in office. How does he come through this? I mean, how is he looking right now? Does he come out of this looking stronger? What? Well, I wanted to take a step back, so I talked today to, to Peter Hart, who conducts with Bill McIntyre, the Republican, Peter being Democratic pollster, the Wall Street Journal NBC poll, and they did a year assessment. And uh, he, Peter said the most common word that was used to describe voters' feelings a year ago about Donald Trump after the election was hopeful. The most common word used now is disgust. And he called it the year of alienation. That uh, Donald Trump. And, and why is this important, Judy? That how people. Because a president needs a reservoir of good feeling and goodwill and confidence. Ronald Reagan had it at Iran Contra, and it sustained him. John Kennedy had it at the Bay of Pigs, where people had a personal relationship. Lyndon Johnson didn't have it. Richard Nixon didn't have it. So when they hit rough patches uh, politically, uh, they didn't have that core of, of affection, feeling, uh, confidence that voters just extended to them and gave them the benefit of the doubt. And Donald Trump does not have it. He lacks it. Voters don't think he has temperament, maturity, judgment, uh, or selflessness. But he does have that core of voters who, are, who say they're still with him, the 35 He does. He has, no, no question about it. But, but uh, Judy, think about it. We now have the best economic times. It's, it, Probably since the late 1990s, the tech boom. I mean, it really just phenomenal times uh, economically. The stock market's going through the ceiling, and he's still, you know, mid, mid 30s. Um, I mean, ordinarily, any president, President Bump, would be at 60 percent favorable in this kind of an economic. And, and that base, it's a slow erosion. It's it's a lot slower than I thought, but it's an erosion. I cited on this show uh, several weeks ago the Fox News. Uh, uh, voters are less pro-Trump than they were. I saw a poll today among white evangelicals drop support of favorability for Trump has dropped 17 uh, percent from 83 percent down 17 percent. So that's an erosion. And all, all this, you know, this porn star stuff, this stuff he says about the countries, mm -hmm. that has this, this slow erosion. It doesn't mean they're fleeing because what we have in this country is negative polarization. Nobody likes their own party very much, but they really hate the other party. So that inhibits it. 
but we are seeing just a steady slow drip, drip, drip. But you still have, uh, you know, you look at the polls, you look at interviews that are done with voters. I've seen some of them in the last few days that people have gone out and done these one year in interviews. The people who like liked him, are many of them are still saying, I just like the fact that he's standing up to the establishment, that he's no, and, telling everybody to go it's, jump you know, in the It's aesthetic, a mode of talk. You know, when this, the things he said about El Salvador and Haiti and, and those countries, a lot of us find it offensive. But a lot of people, whether, whether they think anything of those countries or not, they think, he's talking straight. That's the way I talk. That's the way we talk in the bar here. And so th I had, that was never going to hurt him, that kind of stuff. Straight talk, even if it can be vile, that doesn't hurt him because people see it as he's like me uh, and he's sticking it in their eye, those people who I dislike. And Mark, I mean, you yeah. brought up the economy. In the end, you know, the, the old saying is people vote their pocketbooks, they vote their wallets. Well, um, but, if, but if they, they feel like. I mean, you know, the. the you know, from all available evidence at this point, I mean, it's heading to be a bad Republican year across the board in the in the face of these uh, economic tailwinds uh, that uh, not headwinds, but tailwinds that it should be yeah. helping the party uh, in, in the majority. Um, I, I just point out one thing, Judy, we, we go through this about the closing of the government in, in both 96 and 13. Bill Clinton was president in 96. Barack Obama in 2013. In both cases, voters overwhelmingly blamed the Republicans for the loss. The Republicans retained their majority in the Congress, even though they'd closed down the government in 96. They picked up uh, dozens of seats in 2014, even though it, they were regarded as the villains in closing down the government and depriving people of public services. This has never been an issue on which voters have voted in, the, in an election. There's a lot of news between now and 2018 to come. But I do think the fact that we're focusing on race, that the Democrats have said we can pin the tr Trump racism, that's where we're going to run on. And, and the Republicans have said we're going to pin American identity versus the aliens, that's where we're going to run on. It shows what a different era this is. It's not a normal economic era. It's not a peace and war era. It's an identity era. And even if something as silly as the government shutdown revolves around fundamental issues of that's race a, and identity. It's a good point. And, and let's be very honest. Donald Trump, the president's remarks, his despicable and loathsome remarks uh, about people and where they came, the countries they came from, um, gives the Democrats a, an opening, an advantage, if, if not a challenge, uh, to raise this issue. Something that we will be remembered. Well, we'll know in a few hours what happens. Mark Shields, David Brooks, thank you both.